Welcome to today's video. We are talking iOS 16 and iPadOS 16. We're also talking about how big next year's iPhones could be leapfrogging this year, the new accessibility features that have been revealed for the iPhone, and much more. So let's get right into that. Want the latest Apple news, leaks, and rumors? Subscribe and ring the bell. First question today comes from Team Kinetics. IK Vances, as we're getting closer to dub dub, what is on your iPadOS 16 wish list? And are there more realistic iPadOS 16 predictions? I'm still holding out for a better file management system and something resembling pro apps. And uh, on that point, I think uh, this is one of the big things that everyone's been asking for is that file management system to be overhauled for iOS 16, as well as obviously the multitasking and people wanting to have, uh, you know, multiple window support so that they can drag windows around just like on a Mac. Personally, for me, I'm not that bothered about that part. I don't know why that's the one thing that everyone wants. It's an iPad. It's not supposed to be a Mac. It's not supposed to work in the same way. And working like a Mac is not the same as more powerful. However, all of that being said, file management is something that they need to fix. And I think the easiest way would actually be to just rename the Files app as Finder and just bring over the majority of the Finder features from the Mac. It shouldn't be that difficult. Um, pretty much all of the frameworks already exist. They're already built for the right processors because of M1 and M1 Pro and M1 Max and all of the rest of it. You know, all of this stuff is built for the same architecture for the chips themselves. So in terms of things like disk utility, we should be able to format external drives using an iPad now. There shouldn't really be any reason we can't do that. And the same, to be honest, with the iPhone, if you've got a connection that will take you through to a USB-C port. Now, I also just kind of wonder, now that we're onto USB-C charging on the far side of our iPhone lightning cables, why can't we plug that into a USB-C drive? Like, that would be super easy. Surely that's something that Apple could do if they wanted to. In terms of pro apps, I do think that we should hopefully be seeing Final Cut and Logic and things like that that will work with the iPads. That makes a lot of sense to me. I really don't know why we haven't got it yet. I feel like there must be a major version that they're coming out with, and I still would really like to see Final Cut getting some of that live streaming support that we talked about in the past, so I can stop using something like OBS and use Final Cut to do not just my video editing, but also my live streaming too. Navaron asks, IK Vances, do you suspect that the M2 Pro slash M2 Max will be made on the four nanometer process as been touted by multiple sources, or will we see three nanometers? If not, when do you think we are likely for Apple to make the three nanometer transition. Honestly, I'm not even sure that we'll be seeing it on four nanometers. I think we're probably going to see it on the same process as the A15 chips that we have right now in the iPhone 13. That's my expectation. I don't think that the, uh, the process was ready when they were making these chips. Bear in mind that these M2 chips and probably the M2 Pro and M2 Max chips have already been produced. They're already sitting on the shelf. They've been made. It's not a case of they're waiting for the technology to be ready for it. I think they've made them and I think the delay is now in assembling the systems themselves because of the lockdowns in China. Taiwan has actually done pretty well. Uh, Taiwan is where all the chips are made for Apple at Taiwan Semiconductor, TSMC. Um, so I, I genuinely don't think we're going to see four or three nanometer for these. I think we might see a jump next year though. Uh, whether that will be to four or to three, I just don't know. Randomness R asks, IK Vance, is any chance Apple might go to a seven inch screen with the iPhone 15 Pro Max that's going to get the redesign that John leaked the day before the 13s came out? Honestly, I don't think Apple wants to go that big. I wouldn't want a phone that big. I don't think many people have got a pocket for a phone that big. Um, and if you were going to go up to seven inches, you're very, very close to what we're talking about in terms of an iPad mini, in terms of display size. That just seems too much to try and shove into your pocket and use on a daily. Now, I use a 12 Pro Max. Very happy with it. But it is big. It, it, it barely fits in my pockets. I can't imagine how people with smaller pockets would get along with that, by which I mean... A lot of ladies' clothing tends to have smaller pockets, so that would be awful. I think Sarah Dietschy touched on this and why she's a big fan of the 13 Mini when that came out. Looks like we're losing the Minis, but do we need to go that much bigger with the iPhones? I don't know. Let me know in the comments if you think we do. Slower Cuba asks, IK Vance, I've got the same question as David Stevenson. Are we likely to see the Apple Watch get smaller, more powerful and more efficient brain anytime soon? In addition, what about battery life? My Series 2 still lasts over 24 hours, barely, on days that I'm not exercising too much, but I'd love to have a week or more of battery life. Granted that my perfect world with an antimatter powered or maybe neutrino powered Reed Hail Mary, that watch isn't likely to come about anytime soon, but what are the prospects for longer battery life on the Apple Watch. So yes, I have read Project Hail Mary, 
uh, if I remember correctly, it's Andy Weir, uh, the guy who wrote The Martian. Uh, very, very good book. I think they're making it into a movie as well. There is some extraterrestrial stuff in this one. It's very interesting. It's very cool. Um, and it's it's very trippy when you first get into it, the first couple of um, chapters. If you are interested in this, by the way, Audible is a great way to do it. I have got a link down in the description if you want to use Audible. It's like a, an affiliate link. But this isn't an ad for them. Just thought I'd let you know. But if you're like me, I can't sit down and read books. I have to do them on audio. Anyway, getting back to the Apple Watch, which is what we're talking about here. Apologies for the intermission. The Apple Watch, I don't see that Apple is going to push the battery life that much further. I don't think it's actually something that that many people are excited about. Now, don't get me wrong. I think if Apple was able to keep the devices the same size and add features and add battery life... 100% everyone would be very pleased. If to give the longer battery life, they have to make the devices drastically heavier or larger or bulkier or not add new features, but just add battery life, I don't think there's going to be that much demand for it. Now, I think Apple has basically ridden the sweet spot with iPhones and Apple Watches pretty much all the way through, where they will reduce the physical size of the device in order to give at least the full day's battery life, which is what they've kind of always done. The fact that you've still got a Series 2, which is getting you through 24 hours. I, I had a Series 2 when it first came out. So I'm going to say that's been like five years since that's been out. Um, that's that's doing really well if you're still getting 24 hours out of it. Yes, we definitely uh, do drop some battery life when you're exercising because it is taking a little bit more of that power to run all of the sensors um, on a much sort of quicker interval if you like so bear in mind that it does give you a background level of your fitness and your heart rate throughout the day process shrink i think once we get to the next process uh drop we will probably see some better battery life apple watch won't go onto the lower size processors as quick iphones do because they tend to use the cores from a couple of years back i wouldn't hold your breath on this one tim kinetics asks i gave answers where do you use think Apple sees the M1 Pro chip in their lineup. At present, it's only available in MacBook Pro. As the M1 Pro chip isn't available in the Mac Studio, do you think we'll see a Mac Mini with M1 Pro or an iMac with M1 Pro option? Or do you think it will remain a laptop only chip? It's a very capable SoC that's significantly more powerful than the base M1 and significantly cheaper than the M1 Max. I'd love to see it in more Apple devices. My thoughts on this, and this is not based on uh, any kind of rumors or leaks. I think Apple intended to do a Mac Mini with the M1 Pro, and I don't think they had enough of those M1 Pro chips ready to go when they wanted to launch that, which might have been alongside the uh, Mac Studio. So I have a feeling that we won't see a desktop with the M1 Pro. I think we're actually going to see it when we get to the M2 Pro, and I do think it will come in a Mac Mini form factor, and then the M2 Max and Ultra will then go into the studio. That just makes the most sense to me. I think what happened, though, is because of the kind of super cycle that we had with the MacBook Pros, the fact that it got a full redesign and it got M1 Pro and M1 Pro Max uh, chips, I think there was just so much demand for that that there was no real need for them to do the desktop side of things uh, and they didn't have the chips available to do it so they've kind of delayed that and probably pushing that back to the m2 generation when they can also do it with the redesign then it will get its own little push it'll be the first time you can get a m series pro chip on the desktop and i think that will be a uh, a good thing for the mac mini to kinetics i gave answers apple's new accessibility features for ios 16 look super cool but wouldn't they be more effective if you didn't need to hold up a phone to use them could apple be laying the seeds for ar vr headset or even apple glass imagine a hearing impaired person having the transcript of a person's conversation in real time via some kind of hud on the glasses or a visually impaired person having the world described to them as they walk around. Yep, this all sounds incredible. Uh, they've got basically live captioning for your conversations, which I believe uses the same system that Apple uses for um, transcribing the LiDAR sensors, being able to detect doorways and things like that, and whether a door is open or not. So we're talking about the, uh, the iPhone being able to identify real world items, real world things, real world objects, and detect what they are and be able to sort of let you know whether it's something you can go through or not. Now that sounds exactly like the sort of thing that would be very helpful once you've got an AR or VR headset on, uh, being able to find where your doorways to go to different places are. Also, I know Apple has done some indoor mapping uh, along the lines of what 
Google has done in the past, so inside shopping malls and that kind of thing. So actually being able to identify where the doorways are into different shops would also be very useful for visually impaired people. Apple is already kind of leading the way on all of this stuff. They have been incredible in the amount of stuff that they've done for people with visual impairments. And uh, yeah, it's really interesting that they're already pushing this stuff out, which is potentially to come on the next version of iOS. Uh, it was Accessibility Awareness Day or something along those lines, I believe. I'm obviously not aware enough of it, which is a little bit upsetting about the work that they've done. However, I think all very, very uh, positive. And yes, technologies that can bridge the gap between accessibility and AR and VR in the future. Thanks for watching this show, guys. Thank you to all the Patreons over here. If you want to join them, icavedave.com forward slash Patreon and you get ad-free versions of all of these videos. <laughs>